Behold the majesty. This is Whistler Blackcomb. 8,000 acres of skiable terrain, more lifts than you can name, a great village, one of the best resorts in the world, yada, yada, yada. But here's something you might not know. These two mountains have a history of being competitive adversaries. Whistler and Blackcomb were not always one. For decades, they competed to entice riders to grace their own respective slopes. When Blackcomb came on the scene in December of 1980, Whistler had been operating for 14 years. Blackcomb certainly was the, uh, was the underdog, but being number two gave us something to really chase. We'd be in the Alpine office with our binoculars, looking across the valley. Look at it, they're probably planning something much bigger, so we better get our act together. Through this game of King of the Mountain, each pushed the other to become what they are today and inadvertently created factions of loyalists on both sides. We are on Black Home, the dark side. We're Black Home people. Oh, you're a Black Home kid? I'd rather be on Whistler. It's in my blood. A ton of history here. Whistler is such a big playground. Look at peak here, and it goes right to the peak. I feel like that just gets you high. <laughs> We have Alpine, for one. Proper Alpine, it's not just tree line. Yeah. What's going on trees on Black Home? We've got burnt trees, old growth, pillows, cliffs. I wouldn't really know I don't go over there. <laughs> Whistler's home. I'm kind of a Black Home kid. Black Home. Black Home, baby. <laughs> Black Home also has aerials for sure. and jumps. Black Home sucks, man. <laughs> the patrol always get the Alpine open on yeah. time. Oh, the list goes on. I don't know if we have time for this, guys. Definitely genetic. <laughs> Everyone knows rivalries help push innovation and improvement. Think of the rivalries that have defined the day. Federer versus Nadal, Los Angeles versus New York City, Mustard versus Ketchup. Each side has pushed the other forwards in the spirit of competition to finally lay claim to the coveted title of winner and ruler of the universe, or at least best condiment. So what gives? Why does one have to pick? Can't everyone just ski both? I'm gonna track down some locals to get, or ski, to the bottom of this sibling-style rivalry once and for all. Hi. 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 Nice to meet you. Hey, how's it going? Where do you guys wanna go? Uh, we're thinking like just to start off, maybe just something mellow to test things out and see how you go. Anna Siegel and Alex Armstrong are two diehard riders who claim Blackcomb has the best trees bar none. Show me the way and I'll try to keep up. Okay. Hey, what about these trees? Because these aren't trees. Legs yeah. okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, and those trees weren't good? No, we want to find like spaced out trees so we don't smash into them. just way better terrain. Like steeper, more fall line, and the backcountry off of it is great. Crystal trees are my like go-to spot on the storm day, so I just come here. There's lots of little secret spots you can find. It's just a cool feeling like weaving in and out of them. And this is gonna sound really cheesy, but like being part of the forest. <laughs> There's lots of different like 
aspects. So if the snow's not good on a north aspect, it's good on a south aspect, and you can ski trees over there. Good definition on a power day. So when everything else is white out, you can see where you're going in the trees. We're not out of the woods yet. We've tested the trees on black elm, and let's just say our skis weren't complaining. But that's only half the story. I've got to keep digging for clues. How you ask? Well, I'm heading across the valley to hear the other side. I'm paying a visit to Whistler's famed old growth cedars. Word on the street is that Yuki Sabota and Jake Carney know their way around the block. I like it. I've been riding Whistler for my whole life. And, and you? And me, I don't know. I've been skiing here since I was about three years old. Facing of an old growth forest, how is that different from like the forest in Black? You can ski between the trees. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots more room, yeah. You can ski way faster in the old growth as well, mm -hmm. which I like. <laughs> so, did your parents also ski with them? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, parents. I didn't ski over there until I was a teenager, and I just knew Whistler by the time before I even went over to Black Home. Yeah. My parents met here. Uh, I was put into Whistler Kids, and I just remember skiing Whistler all the time at Mid-Station. Back then, like, instructors had, like, you had, like, a Whistler instructor or maybe a black instructor. <laughs> I definitely had a Whistler instructor. I was a ski instructor. I think what it was, I enjoyed the, the people. It was a big mountain, but it was very small in a way that you knew everybody was up there. Some Whistler dieharders loved Whistler. They were there since day one. They were attached to it. They were emotionally attached to it. I just like coming to Whistler. I like the feel, because Whistler's the skier's mountain. This is where I ski, and I'm happy to be there. Well, that didn't tip the scales. The trees on Whistler ski like a dream and are chock-a-block with snow, too. It might be time to dig into another rumor that's echoed through the valley, that Blackcomb is the home of progression always at the bleeding edge of the sport's limits. Imagine an ancient place, jagged peaks clawing skyward. You're standing on the edge of Blackcomb Mountain. Our goal was to be uh, more youthful and edgy, and along came snowboarding. We had focus groups. We had groups of them into the boardroom, finding out what it is that they wanted, what it is they liked. We traveled around and benchmarked in the U.S. at the big ski areas to try and learn everything that we could about the, the sport, its culture, this big wave that was coming. Snowboarding's tidal wave of progression hit Blackcomb hard and brought everything, including skiing, along for the ride. Elevate, elevate. The when you elevate. Elevate, elevate. Mikey Cicerelli and Alex Bellu Marchand, better known as ABM, are two leading progressive riders. We're going to state their case for why Blackcomb raises the bar. <laughs> Black Home Park has always been the mecca. It's been where I've learned all my first style tricks. I'm sure ABM's the same. It's, it's kind of the place to be. It's the big jumps, you know? The big booters, the big park. That's where you go and send it. First, let me demonstrate how you can rise to the top. Yeah, I had to elevate, yeah.
Laude, you go rip great, great lines and have good sick hits, and then you're like, okay, hey, let's go rip the park. The park's more progressive, you know, the features are here. I think the most progressive skiers are skiing black on. For me, the movies that always stood out were Sandbox, like the Sandbox film. I remember watching those sunset shoots and being like, if I could ever ride that feature, it'd be like, you know, dream come true. So getting to do stuff like this is like full circle. How exactly might Whistler reply to this? Good question. It's long been said that Whistler's racing pedigree is unmatched, having perfected the art, or arc if you will, of the turn. We heard it from the guests. I've gone to Blackcomb, it's so much better, the food's better, the service is better, the lifts are better, and I'm never coming back. So it opened up our eyes. There was a, an, ongoing, an ongoing drive to just do more and more and more. We were constantly caught by surprise. If anyone has a scoop, it'll be veteran racers Robbie Dixon and Meg Cumming. I'll try to catch up as they put Whistler's finest runs through their paces. Shall we? Fortunately, on Whistler, we had amazing programs. The race department started, and that's something Blackcomb could not touch. Growing up, all my competition was always from Whistler. Now, coaching it, it's really amazing to see how good our athletes are. We've had a few races this year, and man, they sweep podiums like no other. Came up skiing in Whistler throughout my whole life. Worked my way up through the rankings and ended up racing World Cup speed events primarily for about 10 years. The Whistler program brings up all around good skiers. Racing, obviously, a big part of it is training, but a large part is being good at everything on the mountain, and we have so many powder days here. It is insanely impressive. It's such a big playground. Yeah. You know, big mountain skiing. Boomers, trees, and yeah, like you're saying, like you, there's so many elements of skiing that you can access here, and it just makes you a well-rounded skier. We were still fortunate that in 82, we had a World Cup race, the one and only World Cup race that finished in the village. So Worcester Mountain gave everybody a big boost. Here's the best skiers in the world, reporters from, from all over the world filming this, and the place was packed. The village was just Busting up the seams, so so we still had our, our moments of uh, in the in the in the spotlight. Apparently, this is the first time a Canadian has ever won a downhill in his own country. All right, well, hallelujah. <laughs> Robbie, <laughs> buddy, told you there, man. Honing your turning radius and satisfying your need for speed leads to one place, the wide open expanse of the Alpine. We've seen and sampled what Whistler has to offer, but what's waiting for us back on Blackcomb? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? It's time to get above the trees and a little closer to the sky. Maddie Richard and Ian Morrison are two locals with deep ties to Blackcomb's Alpine. Let's see if they can uplift its reputation. When you're learning to ski, they actually get you to do it over on Whistler, the family resort. 
because everything's a little flatter, more green, blue terrain. You know, once you're a proficient skier, you just come on over to the better ski hill and off you go. We are on 7th Heaven here on Black Home, the dark side. I have been living in Whistler since March 20th, 1991. My birthday, actually, 31 years. <laughs> I moved here in 98-99. Uh, Met these types of characters and fell in love with the place. Get ready. Blackcomb is back. Blackcomb's marketing, we tried to be uh, out there. Um, we tried to be a little bit spirited and edgy. Get you where you want to go. On top. The summit. Hot dog. Whistler seemed to be somewhat conservative. Whistler Resort, now it's your turn. It was actually a fun marketing rivalry that we had going on. Yeah, we had a softer approach. I would think we weren't as aggressive. Because of Blackcomb's fall line, for, for good skiers is amazing, but for, for the majority of the people, it's hard work. You get a lot more tired skiing Blackcomb in one day than skiing Whistler. And so we tried to focus on, on enjoying the variety of Whistler. Yeah, you go over there, it's nice and easy. I agree. Mellow, everyone's kind of kicked back, relaxed, happy, yeah. family oriented. Here is hardcore. Things are extreme on Blackcomb, man. You know, I like to push myself as a skier. But you mean where all those tracks are? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no! Well, you know what my personal favorite thing of Whistler is? The view of Blackcomb. <laughs> well, that proves that the rivalry is still alive and kicking. After an afternoon of pro-Blackcomb propaganda, it's time to hop back across the valley to Whistler. I've heard about a group of overachieving, high-flying youngsters cutting laps on peach air from bell to bell. The Whistler Freeride Club. I'll track them down so they can have their say on Whistler's alpine terrain. Well, it's a competitive big mountain program, basically 12 to 18 year olds. Um, we ski every Saturday and Sunday, and then some days through the holidays. And yeah, we train for the IFSA freeride comps across Canada. Yeah, I think she's solid. What's the plan here? Hopefully survive. <laughs> Peak chair is pretty steep for Whistler. I know, I'm surprised people even use it over there. Pretty gripped. You know, there's that big scary cliff to go over at the top. That really keeps people on their toes. I don't like going there, it's too scary. There's so much you can do. There's straight lines, and there's airs, and there's open fields, and there's trees, and there's pillows, and there's techie runs. There's so much options. There's always really great turns to be had. Yeah. What is the talent level like in Whistler? <laughs> <laughs> um, very high. Very impressive what these kids are doing these days. It's pretty awesome to be a part of it. Watch these kids grow. It's never like too serious. We're always like trying to have the most fun. fun yeah. It gets us out and then we have like a healthy competitiveness and we like on days where maybe we wouldn't all be skiing together, we still find a way to push each other. You're like your own little community. You go to comps together. I feel like it's different than just our normal ski school. It's like a family. You I did not like expect that, that man. <laughs> Drop! On a good sunny pow day, I'd definitely go peach chair. Yeah. All yeah. the time. Yeah, the hype for the crowd. Yeah, I really like the crowd. It makes everything so much more fun. Someone does something super dope, and everybody sees it from the chair. It gets everybody stoked, and then everybody's just in that amped mood.
he was relentless as far as their their strategy of just go go go. He was what I call a, a, a real driver. He was just out there ongoing. I think he stayed up all night thinking of new ways of, of how to improve and how they could take as much out of Whistler as possible. He was always a few steps ahead of us. First thing we did was hire Paul Matthews from Ecosign, a local planning company, and he came up with an amazing plan for Wizard, Solar, and Seventh Heaven uh, Express. We also added uh, the Horseman Tea Bar, Horseman Hut, uh, doubled the size of Rendezvous Restaurant, and a whole new base area down right across from Whistler Village. This was a significant game changer for Blackcomb the rivalry was really on. After Hugh put in the 7th Heaven, we had to go up in the Alpine. We have to because that's going to really clobber us. That's a death blow if we don't react to this. We've got to put a lift up to the peak. I've always thanked Hugh because with his work on Blackcomb, he's the one who got us the peak chair. I would say it's probably my favorite chair on any mountain I've ever been to. So, here we are, ready to tackle the seminal question of the day. Whistler or Blacko? Why the heck can't you love both? How can so many riders be set in their ways? Why pick one zone, let alone one mountain? How can my human-sized brain comprehend the great mysteries of the universe? Wait, if there's so much terrain, one rider can't possibly have all the facts. Nobody's right and everybody wins. It's an unlimited playground with unlimited zones. We've just seen Whistler and Blackcomb go ski boot for ski boot, from their distinctive flavors of tree skiing to the legacy and characters that define their mid mountains, all the way to the Alpine. We've traversed the history of these iconic mountains to the up and coming chargers pushing the mountains forward today. And here's the rub. Both mountains have been made better thanks to this rivalry. There's been a little bit of a anything you can do, I can do better going on here. And despite now being one resort, Whistler Blackcomb has never stopped trying to redefine what is possible. I mean, the mountains are literally connected with the peak to peak gondola. The result though? Well, I think it speaks for itself. Skiers and riders all have their favorite types of terrain. Some love to shred forested hallways or beneath giant cedars, while others pray to the altar of ski racing, park skiing, or anything in between. So go ahead, pick your side. Beat the drum however you darn well please. This playground isn't gonna explore itself. 